Well, I'm not from here, but that plays a big part in why I am here. I'm not really from anywhere, unless you count a zip code in the middle of the Atlantic as an address. My mother was South African and was old school South African. And when I say old school, I mean old school. I mean 1890s merchant ivory film, old school. Makes Margaret Thatcher look like Martha Stewart. My dad was a test pilot in the British Royal Navy, and his job was to take the best of top gun pilots and teach them to fly into space. So he spent his day job picking holes in the best of the best of the best and mapping it with differential calculus. So to say that I had a high bar at home is, is a bit of an understatement, but I got unceremoniously dumped into American education and pop culture during the 80s and 90s. And so I had this scorecard from my family that was built a continent away, maybe even a century ago, and I was playing a game that the natives all seemed to know and I didn't even know the name of. So I was a stranger in a very strange land, and I was lost. And all through high school even, I kept on waiting for that breakthrough moment. I wanted my sort of breakfast club, 16 candles epiphany, and homecoming came and went, and letterman's jackets, and first dates, and proms and graduations, and animal house keg parties, and none of it, none of it broke through. I still felt like I was encaged in glass, and everybody else, all my friends were coming home. They were having the time of their lives, and I didn't feel alive at all. So by the time I got to college, I was getting a little bitter, and I was getting a little frantic. And I'd learned a bit more about my family history, and my family, like most, has its demons. And, and ours came in the form of depression, addiction, and suicide. And at that point, I kind of took stock, and I thought, well, and. At the time, I wouldn't have been able to give it this label and I wouldn't have accepted it if someone had tried, but I was, I was in the neighborhood of depressed. And I was flirting with a host of addictive behaviors, looking to blow up or numb out that sense of separation. And while my particular sort of aesthetic of morbidity did not tend towards gobbling too many sleeping pills or sucking on a tailpipe. Um, I had a plan, and I was already engaging it. And, and that was basically to start taking bigger and bigger risks in the mountains and the oceans until I either got it or I just let it get me. And I was actually okay with either because I felt at the time that if I couldn't find what I was looking for, that I didn't really have much of a reason to stick around. So one day in the middle of September of my sophomore year, so literally, thank you, Brene Brown, I'll say it, 25 years ago to the day, right? A friend said, hey, try out this windsurfer of mine, it's fun. So I did, and it wasn't fun. It sucked. I sucked. <laughs> I got blown offshore, I couldn't get up, I tried and tried, I was scared, I was frustrated, and soon enough, everybody else packed it in. All the other boats, all the other sails, you know, girls on you know, bikinis, everybody went away. And there was about half an hour left before sundown, and I was just floating downstream. And something happened, and the wind picked up a little bit, and it lifted me up on the board, and I started going, and I stayed up. And then I started going faster, and then I started going fast enough that the board popped up on top of the water, and the next thing I know, I was skimming along. I was flying. And, that, and it just sheer fluke, and it's never happened again in my life, but the, the, line, the alignment of the wind and the sunset made that I was literally flying along on the liquid gold of the setting sun for about 15 minutes, and I was the only soul out there and I still didn't make it back to land. The wind died. I had to swim the whole rig in. And by the time I got you know, limp and exhausted to the beach, I was different. I had, I had found what I had been seeking. I was home for the first time in my life. So that's really been 
the rest of my life, both my life path and what has become my life's work, which is how to have more of these experiences, how to string together these stepping stones of redemption, and then also how can we do more of this together? How can we go beyond just monkeys at a typewriter occasionally getting lucky into something that can scale, into something that we can push out through culture? So let's take a look at this for a moment. You, you've all experienced a flow state. You may have called it something else. You may have not had a name for it. Abraham Maslow called them peak experiences. Jim Fix, back in the 70s, called it a runner's high. Phil Jackson, the Lakers and Bulls coach, calls it being in the zone. Miles Davis, John Coltrane called it being in the pocket, right? But regardless of what we call it, the experience is the same. Time slows down or speeds up, right? A three-hour conversation with a dear old friend or an amazing first date that goes by in what feels like 15 minutes. Five seconds barreled in a wave that feels like five minutes. Myself disappears. Action and awareness merge. The beer and the doer become the same thing. And even if we just glimpse it, we spend the rest of our lives looking for it again. Now, up until really recently, that was as far as it got. That was all we could do. We have these strikes of lightning, yee-haw, amen, and then we just had to twiddle our thumbs and just try spinning the combination lock to see if we could ever get back. But in the last five years, some amazing things have happened. And just raise your hand if anybody is wearing any kind of like smart health, like, you know, fit, Fitbit, fuel band, jawbone up, or any of those kind of things, right? In another year or two, half the audience will be with the smart watches, right? We have an advent in consumer health right now, which is being, allowing us to have the same self-awareness that used to be reserved for yogis, ascetics. Right? The neuro and biofeedback we have access to these days is letting us objectively measure what used to be mysterious. Couple that with fMRIs, with EEGs, with skin pricks and swab tests and on-the-spot lab readings, we have the ability to see under the hood of what used to be ineffable, of what used to be accidental. And there are three amazing and interesting findings I want to share with you. There's a ton, there's an entire universe of this research. But for uh, the span we have today, I want to share the things that matter most. Flow is selfless, flow is effortless, and flow is timeless. So all of us know this guy, right? Our inner neurotic Woody Allen. Never goes away, and thank, thank you for the real one, right? For immortalizing our collective neurosis on film, right? But we've all got that. And how hard do we work to try and get rid of him from time to time? The entire pop psychology, new age self-help movement is predicated on getting to your happy place. And he does not get an invite, right? But what happens in a flow state, and this is fascinating, is that that inner critic goes away. And it's not because I'm saying my mantra. It's not because I've done my post-it note affirmations on my bathroom mirror. It goes away because something happens in our brain, and it's called transient hypofrontality. And what that means is transient means just for a little while, hypo means not a lot of, and frontality, the complex neocortical hardware up front where Woody resides. And people used to think, right, oh, we only use 10% of our brains, so if I'm in a peak performance state, I must be using all of it, right? That's not true. I'm actually using less of it. And when they do brain scans on people in flow states, that whole front section goes offline. It literally is not lit up in any way. And that's the secret to getting the relief, to getting those moments of calm we crave so much. The next, DARPA did a study with military snipers. And they actually went a step further. They said, hey, we're not going to just see if this happens occasionally. We're going to give you guys jumper cable lobotomies, effectively. They basically did transcranial magnetic stimulation. So they sent a magnetic pulse through that area, knocked out the neocortex of these snipers in training, and, they, and, and then measured how long it took them to get from beginner to expert. And they did it in 230% faster time. So think about that for a minute. 230% less time 
to become an expert at something. The 10,000 hours to mastery cut in half. And, oh, by the way, bonus, it's irresistible. I can't wait. Think about all the surf bums around here. They can barely show up to their jobs on time, do their laundry, and manage personal hygiene. But if there's glossy overhead barrels breaking in Malibu, they are there at 6 a.m. clambering into a cold, sandy wetsuit, right, to spend some time in the green room. What is that? And how do we get more of it? McKinsey and Company just finished a 10-year study assessing massive global assay of senior knowledge workers. They found that senior knowledge workers who spend the most time in flow are up to five times as effective as their competition, as their counterparts. So think about that for a minute. If you spent six days a week recovering and preparing, you could show up on Monday, crush it, take the rest of the week off, and keep pace, right, and keep pace with your competition. If you showed up twice a week and could pull that off, they would never catch you. That's how powerful it is. That's what's possible. And lastly, and this has not been shown before, this is, this is literally within the last 12 months, the, black, the map inside the black box, what's actually happening in the neuroanatomy and neurochemistry of the flow experience. So the first thing, just like Buddha's first noble, noble truth, and just like my fledgling efforts on that windsurfer, it begins with struggle. It begins with suffering. My brain, my inner critic, is wide awake and yammering his head off. My brain waves are in a hyperactive beta state. That's how most of us are thinking most of the time. My nervous system is getting pumped with stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, right? I'm getting primed for fight or flight. I'm struggling. Then I say, screw it, or I get too tired, or I get too frustrated, or maybe I'm wise enough to know this is coming, and I relax. I turn off my laptop or chuck it out the window. I go and get a beer, or I take a shower. Albert Einstein used to famously paddle his rowboat out to the middle of Lake Geneva, lie flat on his back, and look at the clouds. But whatever I do, I prompt a release. My brain waves shift from hyperactive beta into relaxed, alert, alpha, a slower rhythm. Nitric oxide flushes all those stress chemicals outside, out, out of my bloodstream. And for the kids, kids watching at home, I said nitric oxide, not nitrous oxide. So put the ready whip back in the fridge, right? <laughs> Next, we get, to this, we get to the goods, the actual flow state. Dopamine kicks in, absolute reward. You're like, yes, you're on the right track. Do more of this, pay attention. Endorphins, I feel no pain, right? I'm Superman. And anandamide, right? An endocannabinoid for you glaucoma and lower back pain sufferers in Abbott Kinney, right? So lateral thinking kicks in, and I drop into theta states, which other than Tibetan meditators and people falling asleep, very few of us actually experience when we're doing stuff. It's that relaxed. So there we are, superpowers, optimum feeling, optimum performing. And then finally, that comes and goes too, right? And many of us have learned, right, the true learning comes not when we're doing stuff, that's just gathering data. The real learning comes when we sleep. Memory consolidation of deep delta waves. And we get this beautiful afterglow of serotonin and occasionally even oxytocin. The people we did it with, how we feel is all wonderful, and we begin again. So this is the inside of what has been for centuries a black box. This lets us actually reverse engineer the genome of flow. And when we think about all the, all the speakers to come today and all of the ideas in the broader TED community, I want to invite you guys to consider this as the opportunity to rocket for rocket fuel. We're gonna hear about inspiring moonshots. We're dedicated to change the world, but we cannot do it, right, on just grit and just dedication alone. Flow is the rocket fuel. Flow is the force multiplier. And in closing, I wanna leave you guys with a, a challenge and a quote from civil rights leader and philosopher Howard Thurman. Because he said, he said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Don't do it. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go and do more of that. 
Because what the world needs is more of us. It's all of us to come alive. Thank you very much.